As academics, uh, policymakers, and practitioners, we want to, uh, the economy that provides stable and equitable growth, or what I call sustainable prosperity. Uh, we want economic growth so that members of society have the possibility of achieving higher standards of living. We want employment stability so that hardworking people are not out of work through no fault of their own. And we want income stability so that equity, so that we can make productive uh, contribute. Those who make productive contributions to the economy get their fair share of the rewards of growth. Now we all know what we want, uh, but unfortunately, the theories and ideologies that dominate economic thinking impede our ability to structure the economy to support sustainable prosperity. Specifically, the ne conventional neoclassical theory of the market economy and the dominant neo uh, ide business ideology of maximizing shareholder value provide policy prescriptions that result in employment instability and income inequity, both of which ultimately undermine economic growth. Now, the root of the intellectual problem is a failure to distinguish between two fundamental economic phenomena the creation of value and the extraction of value. Value creation creates, generates productivity. Value extraction enables individuals to share in that productivity. But simply, value creation results in output. Value extraction results in income. As Mariana Mazzucato and I argue in our paper, which is in your packet, the risk-reward nexus in the innovation inequality relationship, to understand the operation performance of the economy, we have to understand the relationship between the creation and extraction of value. The neoclassical economic theory posits that market forces of supply and demand determine the relation between uh, output and income. That is probably not the case for anyone sitting in this room, if you think about it. And it's not because of so-called market imperfections. It's because as individuals we create value through organizations, not markets. The resource allocation decision of organizations, not markets, have a preponderant influence and the relationship between the creation and extraction of value in the economy and society. These organizations include household families that invest in the future labor force relying heavily on a state finance education system, government agencies that invest in society's knowledge base relying on research facilities operated not only by the state but by universities and companies, um, business enterprises that invest in the current labor force and on which we as consumers rely for the goods and services that we want or need at prices that we are willing or able to pay. Now let me focus on how, given investments by households and governments, business enterprises generate products that are competitive in terms of quality and cost. In a world of technological change and global development, the standards of quality and cost that determine competitive products are in constant transformation. Uh, the generic name for the value creation process that results in higher quality, lower cost products is innovation. Research on innovation shows that it is collective, cumulative, and uncertain process. It is collective because it takes the application of the skills and efforts of large numbers of people in hierarchical and functional divisions of labor to generate the organizational learning that results in competitive products. It is cumulative because the process of developing and utilizing these value creating capabilities must occur continuously over extended periods of time before competitive products emerge. And it is uncertain because a firm that uh, seeks to be innovative may be incapable of developing the technologies and accessing the markets that competitive products need. Now, the uh, collective, uh, cumulative, and uncertain characteristics of the innovation process have profound implications for understanding the relationship between value creation and value extraction. In the presence of innovation, it is impossible to have market determined prices that regulate the relation between output and income, nor will we want the market to play this role. Put simply, because innovation is collective, cumulative, and uncertain, a market determining, determined matching of value extraction to value creation uh, for participants in the economy would stifle the risk taking that is inherent in the innovation process. Rather, what is needed for innovation is a set of social norms that regulates the relationship between value creation and value extraction while encouraging participation in the economy, participants in the economy to invest their labor and capital in value creating capabilities that will generate competitive products in the future despite the inherent risks involved. Now, through government agencies, taxpayers invest in value creating capabilities without guaranteed market determined returns. Rather, we have a politically constructed way in which governments can extract value known as the tax system. Under a t given tax regime, enhanced tax revenues not only reward past government investments but also provide the financial foundation for government agencies to invest for the future. The problem is that, as we all know, the tax regime is not given 
Rather, there are powerful financial interests who argue that for the sake of creating value, uh, we need to lower their taxes. Employees may also invest their labor effort with expectation of future returns if and when innovation occurs. Any employer in an innovative enterprise knows a vast productivity difference between the employee who gets paid to do a specific task at a point in time and the employee who is an integral part of the collective and cumulative learning process over time. Key to the success of the innovative enterprise is his employment of the latter type, the ones engaged in organizational learning. The value-creating enterprise rewards the creative employee over time in forms of higher pay and benefits, employment stability, and career opportunity. The career income of the employee is organizationally determined, not market determined. In a, in a business organization that produces competitive products, the rewards to those who engage in collective and cumulative learning are virtually never uh, guaranteed. In the post-World War II decades, we had a set of social norms under which large established companies provided hardworking and, and creative and loyal employees with these types of career rewards. As a result, innovative business enterprises contributed to stable and equitable growth. From the late 1980s, however, this set of social norms gave way to the ideology that companies should maximize shareholder value. MSV, as we call it, is an insidious business ideology that bears responsibility, in my view, for the instability and inequity in the economy and the current stagnation in job-creating growth. And it has its origins in the United States, where it's still hegemonic. It dominates business schools and boardrooms, as you know, in Britain as well. And the argument is that markets determine the relationship between out and income for all income for all participants in the economy except for one group, common or ordinary shareholders. A firm pays market determined prices to all these other participants who hence have a guaranteed return on their productive contribution. The resultant difference between revenues and costs is a residual that represents a reward or loss to common shareholders for taking risks by investing financial capital without a guaranteed return. Since risk is supposed to result in superior economic performance, so the argument goes, a market economy should maximize the value of the one and only group in the economy who bears risk, shareholders. The problem is that MSV is based on false assumption about who bears the risks and who should therefore reap the rewards in a capitalist economy. As we have already seen, taxpayers and workers make investments in value-creating capabilities that enable the business enterprise to generate co competitive products but without guaranteed returns. Now, as for public shareholders, since the 1980s in the United States, their net contribution to funding business corporations has been negative, and over the past decade, highly negative. Why? Stock buybacks. Since 2001, S&P 500 companies, which account for about 70% of the market capitalization in the United States, stock market capitalization in the United States, have spent over $4 trillion buying back their own stock. For the de past decade, 2003-2012, S&P 500 companies spent 54% of net income on buybacks, and another 37% on dividends, leaving a meager 9% as retentions. Now, I cannot even begin to discuss here the research that we have done on the damage that this mode of value extraction is doing to specific companies, and in the case of the United States, the country as a whole. I will mention, however, that the damage is bound up with exploding executive pay, which was mentioned before. Top executives of major U.S. corporations have used their stock-based pay to extract value for themselves far in excess of what can be justified by their contribution to value creation. Indeed, in doing hundreds of millions, or as often the case, billions of dollars in buybacks annually, the rewards that these executives reap are largely for not doing their jobs of investing in the competitive products of the future. Yet exorbitant rewards being, uh, the exorbitant rewards being extracted from the economy by top executive investment bankers, head fund managers, are cloaked in the language of value creation. For example, you will read that uh, Howard Schultz, CEO of Starbucks, earned $125 million in 2012, $121 million of which of it from stock-based pay. No, under a particular governance regime, Schultz was able to extract that enormous pay. There is no evidence that he earned it. As another example, in a recent paper on Apple's changing business model by uh, myself, Mariana, and Owner Tulum, we show that the last and only time that Apple raised funds from public shareholders was in 1980 in the amount of $97 million at its IPO. Now, hedge fund capitalists such as David Einhorn and Carl Icahn have taken significant stakes in Apple's shares so they can demand that Apple, quote, return value to shareholders, unquote, and 
quote, unlock shareholder value, unquote, by doing the biggest buybacks in corporate history. Like other Apple shareholders, Einhorn and Icon never actually invested in Apple's value-creating capabilities, as the verbs return and unlock imply. What these predators are actually doing is extracting value from Apple uh, that, were created, that was created uh, by taxpayers and employees. And having reaped $376 million in stock-based pay in 2011, Apple CEO Timothy Cook has been only too willing to help them commit this legal looting of the company. Now, many critics of the gambling casino known as Wall Street ponder what to make of the relationship between financial innovation and macroeconomics, a macroeconomic performance. There's a simple answer. This uh, financial innovation has been largely for the sake of value extraction. And as value extraction has come to dominate the financial behavior of the business enterprises which, on which we rely for value creation. To conclude, uh, what is missing from current public discourse on the state of the economy is the fundamental distinction between value creation and value extraction, and an understanding of how, through the medium of financial markets, uh, the value extractors can dominate the value creators and the process foist upon us employment instability, income inequity, and a stagnant economy. Thanks. <laughs>